Well, it's been a real blessing for us to um, come and praise God like this, hasn't it? But it is also a blessing to hear the Word of God. And before Ryan comes to share with us, some of you may not know Ryan. Um, Ryan, do you want to come out, actually, so they can see who you are? And... Um, I've known Ryan now for two or three years, something like that, isn't it? And um, Ryan's become such a dear friend, and he is an evangelist and a minister of the word. He goes out on the streets, wherever the Lord leads him, really. And he's been all over the globe, he's been in some very dangerous places, bringing the word of God. And we are so thankful to God that as an America from Pennsylvania, the Lord has brought him to England. And, you know, we just thank God because we are in desperate need in this country of the word of God, aren't we? Our streets are in desperate need of the gospel of Jesus Christ, aren't they? So many people are in ruin before they've reached the age of 18. And uh, Ryan has had a real heart, particularly this time, um, as he's been with us. Um, to reach out to the young people and has had many real God-given encounters where the Lord has used him to touch young people's hearts and also to preach to adults, of course. Um, but it's been wonderful how the Lord has really put this burden on his heart for the youth and the young people. And uh, we've seen that burden increase. Ryan's been um, living with somebody, somebody's house who's currently in Dubai is a member of our church fellowship, a chap called Russell, and has been living in his house for the last few months or so. And uh, this burden has increased, I think, brother, is that fair to say, over the last uh, few months. But Ryan's also ministered the word of God to us at Court Farm. It's been a real blessing and privilege to get, him know, get to know him personally and also to be built up through his ministry. So without any further ado, let's pray for our brother and then I'll hand over to Ryan. Father, I just want to thank you for your servant. I want to thank you, Father, for his love for you. I want to thank you for putting a burden in his heart for the lost. Lord, thank you that you have led him all the way. You've preserved his life. You've kept him in difficult places. You've preserved him. You've hidden him away. We thank you, Lord. You kept him from the eyes of men. And you have brought him out to be before men at just the right time. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And Lord, we are asking you this evening, for we do not put our trust in a man or in a ministry, but the God of the ministry. We ask you, O oh Lord, this evening, that by the power of your spirit, you would come upon our brother afresh, that you would equip him for all that you would say to us this evening. May your anointing be on his speaking and on all our hearing. For, oh Lord, we live in critical days and we need to hear the word of the Lord. We are asking you, Lord, that you would work this word of yours into our hearts so that we would be changed by what we hear and save us, Lord, from being deceived by thinking we've received the word simply by agreeing with what's being said. We pray, oh God, that you would cause this word to change our lives and our attitudes and our priorities and the way we see things. All oh, be with us, oh God. And anoint our brother this evening, we pray, and we will give you, O oh Lord, all the praise and the glory. Anoint our hearing and our brother's speaking and deliver us from any distractions of the evil one or our own minds. Be with us, Lord, we pray. And we trust you and by faith stand into that anointing which you provided. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Can I give you that? Yeah. You might want to put that somewhere in your pocket or something. God bless you, brother. My shirt. How do I turn it off? Okay, yeah, it's just that one.
Okay, good. Praise God. Can you hear me? Yes. Is that on? I don't know. It sounds a bit. Is it? Oh, it is. You can hear me? Yes. Praise God. It's wonderful to be here. Um, please forgive me for the casual dress. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't planning to minister here before you, so I would have brought some slightly nicer clothing. But uh, I don't think God's so in, uh, concerned about that these days, anyway. See. Um, it's wonderful to be here and to have the opportunity to bring the word to you, the people of God. Wasn't expecting it. Um, wasn't expecting to be able to go to the streets as well. And we had that opportunity uh, this afternoon. Uh, yesterday, I was just spending time in the word in the, uh, the trailer. And I think the Lord was speaking to me and saying, go out to the streets tomorrow. And I came here really just to rest and to get refreshed like many of you did. But I knew that the Lord was speaking, and I knew that there was town nearby. So uh, last night before bed, I asked Jared, would you like to come to Evesham with me? And he said he would pray about it. And uh, this morning, he and uh, Brother Ian came to the, the door, and they said they both wanted to come. And then uh, Milko and Young He also joined us. And there were five of us on the street today. And as of you know, 24 hours before we left, this was not even a thing. This wasn't even a plan. But it's amazing how the Holy Spirit can work. And uh, John mentioned that I've been staying in someone's home in Orpington, who's out of country, and he's allowed me to use his vehicle. So I've had a car for the last four and a half months. Uh, I've been coming back and forth for 10 years from the States to London, but I've never had use of a vehicle. So most of my ministry has been limited to London. But because I've had use of a car, um, I decided to travel the country. I felt the Holy Spirit was leading me to do that. And I've lost track, but it's been about 60 different places I've had the privilege to go in just the last few months, including different parts of London. And so uh, it, it's, an, it's an exploration, and it's exciting to visit these different places and to see the beauty of the country. And today, just being very near this town center, I felt like this is where we were to go. So uh, I just want to share with you what happened today because it was really, really remarkable. And this is coming from someone who does street ministry basically for a living. Today was remarkable. We got into this town and uh, of course, none of us had been there and we didn't know, you know exactly what to look for, but I'm usually looking for some kind of a, a street where there's only foot traffic, where there's some shops to preach and just trying to be led by the Holy Spirit. And we found that not really that busy of a town center, but enough people where we could speak to them and set up shop. And as we were praying beforehand, before we left, I felt like the Lord was at, was leading for Ian to bring his guitar. So, and you know, it's just a simple thing, but just God can, he can say the simplest things in prayer. If we, if we just stop and pray, it's amazing what God can reveal to us just when we pray. And if we had just not prayed or said, we'll pray in the car, or we'll pray when we get there. Now, sometimes that's the only option, but in this case, we had the opportunity to prepare in advance. And it was just in our prayer time in this room, 10, 15 minutes, that the Lord just sort of spoke that to my heart and he was more than willing to bring his guitar. So he brought the guitar and he set up shop and we found a spot and he started singing songs and people were coming immediately. It was really wonderful. And so much so that I couldn't even start to preach because people just kept coming. And then he'd sing and then he'd stop and then we'd talk to people and this went on for 30, 45 minutes. And um, finally I did decide to open up and speak. And I, I, there are a few places I've been to in the country where I felt like the ground was as soft as it was today. I mean, I'm used to getting heckled and berated. And of course, God's always doing things and there are wonderful opportunities that come, but it's getting worse out there. You know, I don't, to be honest with you, the first time I came here was March of 2011. I don't even recognize that country anymore. The Great Britain of March 2011, that country doesn't even exist anymore. Things have gone down so quickly, so rapid here, morally, spiritually. And the same thing goes for America. And I can tell you, it is directly connected to the legalization of gay marriage, which happened in 2011 in this country which happened in 2013 in the United States.
direct connection. God has to judge. He has to when a government decides to do something like this. And then furthermore, when the quote unquote ch church gets behind it as well. So the ground is often very hard, but today the ground just seems so soft. People were receptive to the preaching of the word. We had a little bit of pushback, but even the people that were pushing back were, were willing to go into conversation. There was a lady who came and was fairly strong with me. She said she had, I believe, either a drug or an alcohol problem, didn't she? And then she sat down on the bench again, and young he went and kneeled down in front of her and put her hand on her knee and began to minister to this woman. The woman came to tears at one point. Very powerful. So even a situation like that where this lady was initially very resistant, she started to soften. And you could tell from the looks on the people's faces that this was not something they see in the town center of Evesham. They don't see the word of God being preached like this. They don't see somebody setting up with a guitar and singing. And I love being in these kind of environments where it's not happening. These little nook and cranny towns. I don't, I've never even heard the names of some of these towns until the last couple of months. And you go in and all of a sudden God says, I have a ministry for you here. So it was wonderful. A number of wonderful conversations. But the highlight for me, I was preaching the second time. We'd stopped and then I started again. And there was a young girl standing across the street listening. And I made some kind of appeal. I can't remember what it was. And she said to me, what if I have a demon? That's what she said to me. And I said, just come and talk to us. So she came close and she started to talk and she began to open up the un-British. She started telling us her whole life. I have voices talking to me. They have been for years. She said they forced me to do things. And she even identified the name of a female demon that comes and speaks to her all the time. And I had absolutely no doubt this girl was completely telling me the truth. She was not making this up. And she was so honest about it. And uh, I was shocked, really. I was stunned to see this, to see just the, the willingness to open up like this. And she wanted help. She desperately did. So I said, let's sit down on the bench. And Ian sat down with me. She sat in the middle of us. And I began to just sort of walk through her life and ask her what's been happening. She said she was sexually abused as a child. Won't go into the details. Numerous times she said she hears these voices. She said she can't control when they come to her. And I think she even identified the woman's name as Azriel, this supposed female demon that's coming to her. And just so transparent about the brokenness. And I felt led to share the story with her from Mark chapter 4, where Jesus crosses over to the Gadarenes and he meets a man who's basically demon possessed and is, is out of his mind, essentially, living naked and chained and everything else. And then when he sees Jesus, he knows that it's Jesus and he's, he cries out to him. And I said, I actually read the story right there, sitting next to her, right out of the Bible. And I said, Jesus can do this for you. Now, I haven't done deliverance ministry like this in quite a while. Sometimes I go to Africa and to the Philippines. It's more common there. But on the streets of the UK, this is not something. It could happen, but the people just aren't as open to it, generally speaking, in the West. But this girl was so broken and so looking for help. I said, we're going to pray for you. And we're going to pray that you are delivered because the same Jesus that did this, he can do it for you. So, that, so I was expecting, I was prepared for anything. You know, if you've ever seen this or been a part of this kind of ministry, people can start screaming. They can start yelling. They can start wiggling on the ground. They can start foaming at the mouth. I've seen this in Africa many times. I didn't know what was going to happen. And Ian, I think you were prepared for the same, weren't you? So we both just laid hands on her, and I just began to pray for her. I didn't raise my voice. I didn't get loud and all charismatic or anything like that. Just tried to pray as God led me, and there was very little visible reaction from her. At one point, the Lord gave me a vision, which I shared with her, and, I, and, she, and she, she nodded her head. It resonated. At another point, he gave me a word of knowledge, which I shared something from her teenage years. It re that also resonated with her. She identified with it. And at the end, she opened her eyes. And she took a deep breath and she said, wow. She said, I, that was amazing. She said, I feel like a, a demon has been exercised from me. That's what she said. Does that not elicit a praise God? Does that not excite you? If that doesn't excite you, what is going to? She said, I don't hear this anymore. She said, I feel like the, the person is far away from me. 
This happened just a few hours ago, 15 minutes from here, five, six miles away. We believe this girl was completely set free. I said to her, the Jesus that did this for you, he wants to save you. I'd shared the gospel with her prior to this. Now, some would have shared the gospel later. And I'm not going to get into the specific approach, but the gospel is the first message. You know, because if you just focus on the issue so much, then it can become man-centered. You know, she had a need, but I wanted it to her to know this is not about you. This is about God. And you're a sinner. And you need to be saved from your own sins. So I shared that message first, and then we got into the chapter four and the prayer. And after this happened, I mean, she went on, she must have said it four or five times, didn't she? How light she felt and how she just couldn't believe what had happened. And I said to her, do you want to give your life to Jesus? Without hesitation, she said yes. I mean, this wasn't even any kind of a, you didn't have to twist her arm. And, and I explained to her what it means to follow and she was very willing to. So we prayed with her right there. We led her. She was very open. And uh, we believe that she really was born again. We really do. This was, this was legitimate. This was real. And, uh, and she took a Bible. It was your Bible, right, wasn't it? She took the Bible. So she has a Bible. Pray for her that she gets into a good church because I told her, don't go to a church that's LGBT. Don't go to an Anglican church. Don't go to a Methodist church. I mean, the list is getting a lot smaller for options, isn't it? I don't know what her options are locally, but that's what I encouraged her to do. So please pray for this girl. Her name is Alana. And she even hung around there. There was another young girl that came with a similar situation, and they actually started talking to each other while we were ministering to Alana. And this other girl came. She wanted counsel as well. She said, I'm depressed. I'm suicidal. I mean, this is everywhere. This is everywhere in this country, up and down, left and right, everywhere. This is what's going on. 13 to 19, suicidal, cutting themselves, drugged, gender confused, Wales, south of England, north of England, Scotland, London, everywhere, everywhere. Not a day do I go out and don't see it. So the Lord moved powerfully today, and I am so encouraged and so thankful that there's, there's, a, there's already been a ministry that's gone out from these meetings, and you haven't even gone home yet. It happened right here in this local community. Praise God. The Lord's given me a message I'd like to share with you tonight. I've given it a title. The title is called, It's Not Yet Time. And I'd like you to turn with me first to Matthew chapter 16. Same place we started this morning, ironically. Our brother started here this morning with a different, a different message. Matthew 16, 21. It's not time yet. <clears throat> And in the New King James Version of the Bible. There were a number of other things that happened today, but I honestly can't remember them. There were so many things that happened. It was just a wonderful day. I looked at the clock and three hours ago, we actually had to leave this one girl, the second young lady that came over with some of the depressive issues. She wanted to really spend time, but we just didn't have the time. And I invited her to come back here to the meeting. And I said, we have some pastors here that can counsel her. So I was going to dump her off on you guys. But... <laughs> She didn't come back. So <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his di disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Go over to chapter 17, verse 22. Now, while we were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up and they were exceedingly sorrowful. Go to chapter 20. Starting in verse 17. Now, Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day 
he will rise again. Let's look to the Lord again. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would open it up to us. I thank you for what you've done already this afternoon in the streets of Evesham. Lord, I thank you that there's already been fruit born from these meetings, that ministry has already gone forth, that lives have already been touched, Lord, outside of here, Father. And I pray this will be just the beginning, Lord. I pray there'd be great overflow from what's been imparted the last few days to the many, Lord God, that we would go back and we would take something with us, Lord, to bless people, that we would not just keep it to ourselves, Lord. Open this word up to us, Lord. I pray that you speak to each and every one, particularly our young people that are in the room. Lord, would you show them their need to be born again? Show them their need for a Savior. Show them their need to come through and to put you first in all things, Lord, that there is no other way to live their lives, Father. I ask, Lord, for a great unction, a great prophetic unction, Lord God, tonight. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Three times toward the end of Jesus' life, he told his disciples that he was going to go up to Jerusalem, that he was going to be scourged, that he was going to be taken captive, that he was going to be beaten, and that eventually he was going to be crucified. He told them three times the same thing in a very short period of time. There was a time that Jesus was going to be taken captive, and he was going to be given a false trial, and he was going to be mocked and ridiculed and mistreated and scourged, and eventually crucified on a cross. There was a time when it was going to happen. But until that time happened, there was a lot of work to be done. There was a lot of work to be done until he suffered and until it was actually time for him to die. And until that time came, he was not distracted by anything. He was not hanging out, just doing his own thing, living in fear, worrying about the future. He was committed to the purposes of God the Father. He was going to go wherever God the Father sent him, and wherever God the Father did not want him to go, he would not go there. But he did not stop ministry, and he never lived in fear. Seasons, times are so important, especially when persecution is coming, which it is, which it is. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We need to know where we are to be and where we are not to be. We need to be prayerful. We need to be fasting. We need to be really seeking to hear the voice of God. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, you don't have to turn there, chapter 3 and verse 1, a well-known, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. There was a season and a time for Jesus to die. There was a season and a time for him not to die. And the same thing goes for you and I. There is a season and a time for us to suffer, to be persecuted, to lose things. But then there's a time and a season when that's not going to happen. And until that happens, we have no excuse to live in fear and to live for ourselves, which many of us in the church are doing. Which many of us in the church, oh, you come to a conference. This looks really spiritual on the outside because you're here. Deep, deep down inside, many live for themselves. In fact, I'm going to take it a step further. I believe the Holy Spirit has wanted me to say this to you. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but for some of you here, this is not a conference. This is a holiday. Because you can't, you don't want to get vaccinated. You don't want to pay for a negative COVID test both ways. You don't want to quarantine because it's an extra four or 500 pounds. So this is your holiday. And you put a Christian spiritual stamp on it this week. Because it's cheaper and it's harder to travel right now. And we are not ready for what's coming. We are not ready for what's coming. Turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Starting in verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the, Jew the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. 
for even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secrets. Jesus had kept away from the region of Judea for about six months prior to this because the Jews were seeking to take his life because he had healed a blind man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. That was the only really major miracle that he had, or healing miracle that he had done in that area. But it was enough to have him running for his life, the religious epicenter of things. So he's now preparing to appear one more time in Judea. He's going to come back, but not the way his brothers want him to. See, he was starting to become famous and develop a bit of a following, but it was just in small pockets. It was not out in the open so much. He was in Galilee. It was more obscure and unknown. But people were starting to recognize him. So his brothers know this. So his brothers are saying, go up to this feast where everybody's going to see you and make it all known to everybody. But it was not the right way for Jesus to go at that time. Now, there was a time, there would be a time when he would go up to Jerusalem and he would show himself openly. And that would be a few days before he was to be crucified. He would ride in on a donkey and they would throw palm branches at his feet and they would cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they would basically worship him. That's when he would really openly manifest himself in that region. But this here is not yet the time for it to happen. It's not yet his time to be crucified. So what is he doing? These brothers who, you know, they may love him with a natural love. They may think that it's cool. They've got a brother who's becoming famous. So why don't you become more famous? These are not spiritual people. This is their natural brother. They don't have any idea what's going on spiritually. And even the disciples, to a large extent, didn't know what was going on spiritually. Even they, although they'd spent so much time with him up until this point, even they really didn't know that this was a Messiah. Maybe a, a temporary revelation here and there. Matthew 16, Jesus did have, Peter did have what appeared to be a revelation of the Messiah. But then shortly thereafter, he's asking for booths to be made for both Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. And you can tell he's not as spiritually minded as someone who would make that declaration. So this reality of who Jesus was, was even veiled to those that were closest to him. So his brothers want him to go up and show himself openly, develop a following, promote yourself. So much of the church world is like this today, isn't it? And it seemed like the COVID-19 pandemic really took a blow to some of these large ministries that are very concerned about making themselves known, didn't it? And their mega churches and the false gospel that they preach and the money coming in, and, and, and more and more church plants, which are basically like social clubs, a lot of them. I think you, most of you know what I'm talking about. Jesus knows this is not the way for him to go. Let's look at verse 6. Again, Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. Jesus is a man of purpose. Jesus is a man who is busy. Jesus is a man, he, he can't make a wrong step. Every single place he goes, every word that he speaks matters. But people who are not living with purpose, people who are not living for the things of the kingdom, he's saying, you can go up anytime you want to. You're irrelevant. The devil's not concerned about you. You can go up tomorrow. You can go up three days from now, five. Nobody's even going to notice. Which kind of Christian are you? Are you a Christian with purpose? Is every step that you take and every place that you go important? Does the devil know where you are? When we came into that town today, the devil knew we were there. And I can feel it sometimes when I go into a town center or a city and I'm with somebody, I'll say to them, the devil knows we're here. And not because we're special, but because how many people are really preaching in the streets and really preaching a true gospel in these places? How many people are standing up in the streets and crying out against the sick, satanic, homosexual, and transgender agenda, which is destroying this society. The biggest problem in Great Britain, number one, is homosexuality amongst youth and young adults. 
It is the biggest problem in this country, period. And if this government had a shred of moral decency, even a shred of godliness, they would be trying to step in and do something about it. Instead, they are promoting it. They are promoting it. Locking arms with the state church. Locking arms with every other major agenda here, the media and the NHS and everybody else. Our young people are being thrown to the wolves. The devil knows when we go into these places and speak about this. The devil knows when we go into these places and talk about the falsehood of Islam and who false prophet Muhammad actually is and all the wives that he had, sexual behavior with children. So Jesus was a man of purpose. Matthew Henry commented on this verse. Those who live useless lives will always have their time ready. They can come and go as they please. But those whose time is filled up with duty will often find themselves restrained. And they have not yet time for that which others can do at any time. Are you a person of purpose? Or is your life just sort of day to day, whatever, whatever my wife tells me to do on Saturday, whatever the work list is, you know? Oh, if I talk to somebody about Jesus this month, that's good. But if, if I don't, that's not really a big deal either. Are you a person of purpose for the kingdom of God? Verse 7. Here he continues on this theme. Why can they go anytime they want to? Well, he says it. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Jesus said the world doesn't hate you. That's why you can go anytime that you want to. But the world hates me. I can't just show up whenever I want. It could cost me my life. I can't afford to make a misstep. You, on the other hand, you can do anything you want to. You are the backslidden Christian or the, or the soft Christian that won't take a stand for righteousness. That's basically, in the modern day, that's what he's saying to his brothers here. And my pointed question for you right now, does the world hate you? Does the world hate you? And if the world does not hate you, why does the world not hate you? Because when you stand for truth and you stand for righteousness, the world is going to hate you. People aren't going to hate you for saying Jesus loves you. People will hate you when you stand in the street and say homosexuality is a sin. A child cannot pick his gender. Muhammad was a false prophet. Those are the things that people will hate you for now. Killing a baby inside of the mother's womb is not abortion. That's a man-made word, a liberal word. That's like putting lipstick on a pig. This is murder. It's murder. These are the things that the world hates. And it was Jesus' righteousness that got him crucified. He was a prophet, a priest, and a king. But it was prophetic ministry that got him killed, folks. It was his prophetic ministry that got him crucified. Primarily because of all the parables that he told to the Jewish people about how the kingdom was going to be taken away from them and transferred to the Gentiles. This was the thing that they hated the most. And he said it over and over again in one form or another. The world cannot hate you, because it hate, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Some of you know that three weeks ago tomorrow I was arrested in Orpington in southeast London for standing in the streets preaching with a couple uh, folks from Court Farm Evangelical Church. I had said that homosexuality is a sin, that churches with rainbow flags on them are not real churches. And there was a young lady who identified as, as gay. She called the police. She kicked over my bottle of juice right between my legs. She, she called the police. They came, four officers on the scene. And they completely misrepresented this situation, made false accusations. A lot of these officers don't even understand the law. I've come to realize it was not illegal what I had done. It's not against the law to say that in the streets in the UK. That's protected speech. But because they're given all this LGBT training in the courses, just like everybody else is at every level of society, their ears are primed to hear that word, homosexuality, or hear the word Islam. So they came, something had happened about an hour earlier, they already knew who I was, and I think that this was an opportunity for them to really pounce. So it really didn't matter what I said or did not say, they ended up putting me in handcuffs, they formally arrested me for violating uh, Section 4A of the Public Order Act, put the handcuffs on me so tight that I had marks on my arms for 36 hours afterwards, put me in a police van, took me to Bromley Station, 
and put me in a cell for 10 hours. In the beginning of that 10 hours, near the beginning, I was given a mental health evaluation by the NHS. How's your family? Tell me how you're doing physically. How long have you been here trying to be my buddy? The whole thing was about don't talk about homosexuality anymore. I, I didn't give in to it. He didn't tell me it was a mental health evaluation. But it was very obvious to me by the line of questioning in the beginning that that's exactly what it was. And I determined I'm not going to yield to this. So we got onto the topic finally that he wanted to talk about, LGBT. And the whole purpose of this meeting was to try to get me not to talk about this in public anymore. And at one point I looked at him and I said, would you call a banana a carrot? And at first he didn't understand, so I repeated the question. And he said to me, if somebody was offended, I would. That's what he said to me. And I looked at him and I said, I should be the one asking you the questions. So that lasted about 30 minutes. They finally took me out of the cell, put me back in the cell, and at 1.45 they released me. I was given a simple caution, which is basically a crime, no crime. You're not being convicted of a crime. You're not being charged. But you're, they basically are, it's, it's in the books that they, they've gotten an arrest and something has been put on paper. It is a, like a minor conviction. And so my name's in the police national computer for three years. This is very problematic for me because if I get stopped again on the streets, the police can run my name and they're going to see my name there and see this incident, which is going to make it much easier for them to arrest me the next time. Up until this happened, my name was never in the computer. So when they would run my name, they would not see anything. And I think they would let me go because I'm a foreigner. But now that's not the case anymore. The Christian Legal Center has taken up my case and they're fighting it for me. So please pray that this gets overturned because this could be very problematic for my future here. But the point is this. The world will hate you when you testify of it that its works are evil. I was not arrested for preaching the gospel. John Sherwood was not arrested in April for preaching the gospel in Uxbridge. He was arrested because he said there are two genders and two people of the same sex cannot make a baby essentially, is what he said. And he was just charged two weeks ago. His case was open for investigation. He's going to court in two weeks. 71 years old. So Jesus tells his disciples, or, or his brothers rather, in verse 8, you go up to this feast. I'm not yet going up, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. So the brothers go before him. When he says, my time has not yet fully come, I believe he's referring there to his entrance into Jerusalem before he's crucified. I think that's what he's talking about. Now, he does eventually go up to this feast. Verse 10 says that he goes up. He goes up secretly after his brothers. And then what does he do? We're not going to read through all this. Halfway through the feast, he finally goes into the temple, and he stands up and he teaches and essentially makes himself known but he did it halfway through and people wouldn't be looking for it. And even prior to that, the people are wondering where he is. They're looking for him. But Jesus was not looking for attention. He was not looking for a following. Even when he came into Jerusalem before he died at the very end and they worshipped him, he was not coming in looking to be worshipped. He was coming in to die. He was coming in to die. And folks, this life is not about us. This is not about our pleasures. It's not about our desires. It's not about self-preservation. You are dead in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. You are dead to your old life. It is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you and the life that you now live in the flesh. You live by faith in the Son of God, wherever it takes you, however difficult it might be. So he comes up to the feast. Eventually he teaches. In verse 16, they're questioning him. He says, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Okay, so he's basically saying, I came from God's. I'm speaking the doctrine of God's. Verse 18, he who speaks himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So there's a lot of dispute here. People are getting upset. Let's go down to verse 25 and pick it up. Slowly things are starting to build. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? 
However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. So they're confused about him. Can this really be the Messiah? But they're saying he looks, he speaks boldly. We know they're already angry with him. Now he's come into the temple in this big feast. He's speaking boldly, and yet they still haven't done anything to him. Pick it up in 28. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple. Now he's crying out. He's getting bolder and bolder. You both know me and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Verse 30, therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. He revealed himself halfway into the feast. He taught boldly in the temple. The people started to wonder, why isn't something happened? Then he got bolder. He raised his voice up even louder. He declared himself to be from God. But they still didn't take him, even though they wanted to, because it was not his time. It was not his time. And this is the theme of the message. You and I will be persecuted. You and I will have to suffer. Jobs might be lost in this room. Homes might be lost. Church buildings might be closed. Children might be taken away from us. It's already happened in Norway. It's already happened in Norway and in some other communist countries in the European Union. It's happening. Children are being taken away by the social services. Anything could be taken away from us. But until it is your time to be persecuted, until it is your time to suffer and to lose something, you do not have to live in fear of anything. This concept of self-preservation and worrying, can I say this on my job? Can I pray for this person? Can I do this? Can I do that? What if? What happens if I do? What happens if I do this? You don't have to worry about any of it because until it's your time, it does not matter. God is sovereign. He is sovereign over your life. He's sovereign over every detail. He knows you have a family to feed. He knows you have a mortgage to pay. He knows you have a rent and you have car payments. God knows those things. If you're a faithful Christian, he's not going to leave you hanging out to dry. He's not just going to throw you to the wolves. We have no excuse to live in fear. None. Because God's time is appointed for these things. Remember the verse in Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Until it is your time, you have nothing to worry about. Absolutely nothing. This became a prominent theme in the ministry of Jesus. And I want to look at some more places where we see it. Because from the very beginning, he was put in situations where they were threatening to take his life. They were threatening, they wanted to, to, to take him captive. They plotted against him. But until it was his time to go up to Jerusalem, it wasn't going to happen. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> this is the beginning of his ministry. He goes into the synagogue. He quotes from the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is on me to preach the gospel to the poor, to go to the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and on and on. And when he sat down after saying this, all eyes were fixed on him in the synagogue. This was a special moment. This was like a public introduction in a sense. They noticed that something was different. And they said, isn't this Joseph's son, the carpenter? And they're wondering, how can he speak like this? How could he make these kind of declarations? And they're marveling at him. But Jesus, as usual, is unmoved by the praises of people. He's unmoved by the attention. You know, I, can, I, I want to even suggest something to you. I know in God's sovereignty, the whole Passion Week and the, the Passover and him going to the cross, it all was supposed to happen a certain way. But when he came into Jerusalem riding on that donkey and they threw palm branches at his feet and they worshipped him and they cried out, Hosanna, it's like they had a momentary glimpse of who he actually was. Almost like he could have gotten away with it and not been crucified maybe. What did he do the very next morning in the temple? Went right in and flipped everything over. Totally unmoved by the praises of men. 
And I can't help but wonder, outside of God's sovereignty, don't misunderstand me what I'm saying here, outside of God's sovereignty, I can't help but wonder if Jesus had not gone into the temple on that, I'm not sure he would have been crucified. He was so unmoved by praise and so unmoved by worship and getting people's attention. The first thing he did was go in and do the thing that was going to incite the leaders just as much as anything. Because surely many of the people standing on the ground before Pilate's saying, crucify him. Surely many of those same people just days earlier were throwing palm branches and crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The price that we have to pay for righteousness. But it, but it was just one righteous act the next day that completely turned the tables again. And now they want him killed. So they're looking at him here back in Luke 4. They're amazed. Jesus doesn't care. What does he do? He tells two, he references two Old Testament stories. One about the prophet Elijah, one about Elisha. We're not going to go over them uh, verse by verse here. And essentially says that God used them to minister to Gentiles instead of Jews. Jesus unmoved by their praise, unmoved by their Phariseeism and their religious piety. So they were just fixed upon him in amaze, but now look at verse 28. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Why did he get away? Very beginning of his ministry. He's on the, the edge of the cliff, about to be pushed over to his death. Why did he get away? It was not his time. It was not his time. Young people, are you listening to me? You don't have to be scared. You don't have to be scared to stand for truth in your school. What was it, two years ago, there was a 10-year-old girl who was, I believe, suspended in Croydon in South London because she didn't want to take part in an LGBT lesson for five days. And she went back to the mother, the counterterrorism unit came knocking on the door of the mother's flat. She stood for Christ. She's a Christian. And she was given a level of notoriety by this, by the Christian concern. They did a whole story on her. God worked it together for goods. Stand for truth, young people. You don't have anything to be scared of. My message to the youth tonight, as much as anything, who are in the room, live by faith. Don't be scared of anything. God is with you. God loves you. He wants your courage and your boldness. You can make more of an impact on your generation than I can to a large extent. I sit down and talk to people your age all the time, and I can speak from my experience and Bible knowledge, but you are their age. You have a testimony of being delivered from sin, of growing up in a Christian household, some of you do. That's a testimony in and of itself in 2021 in the Western world. I live in a Christian home. We open the Bible up every night. My parents love God. They take me to church. They pray for me. I've been protected from a lot of these things. That's a testimony. Hallelujah. That is a testimony. Until it is your time, nothing is going to happen to you. You've got to believe that tonight. There is a spirit of fear over this land. Every time I come in here it's on the airplane to Heathrow, I can feel something change in the atmosphere. And it's not just the weather. <laughs> I can feel something change. And I, can, I, I walk through Heathrow. When I've not been, say I've not been for nine months or ten months, you walk in, it just feels eerie. Everybody's wearing black. Everybody's staring at you. There's cues everywhere. Everything's backed up. You feel like you're just being watched. It's communism. That's what it is. It's communism. That's what it is. John chapter 5. Let's continue to look at a, some examples of where Jesus is, could have been taken away captive, could have been harmed. If it weren't for the intervention of the Lord, would have been. I referenced this story earlier. He has healed a man at the pool of Bethesda, a man who was paralyzed and sick for many, many years. And he did this on the Sabbath, nonetheless. The religious leaders couldn't care less that this guy's been healed. All they care about is that this was done on the Sabbath. So let's pick it up in verse 16. 
For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God's. Now think about this, folks. He's already in trouble. He knows he's already in trouble. What do we often do when we, all, when we know we're in trouble? We back off. That, that bold edge is taken away. He knows he's in trouble. What does he do? He steps it up another notch. And he basically declares himself to be God. And he knows they're not going to harm him because it's not his time yet. Do you see the theme here? You can say anything that God is leading you to say. You can do anything he is telling you to do. No matter how bold or radical or disrespectful to this sick world that we live in, no matter what, if it's not your time, God is going to make a way for you. You don't have to fear anything. Incredible. He knows his back is against the wall and he just goes one notch higher. Because you know what, folks? There are times in our lives where we're going to get before authority figures, aren't we? It doesn't happen often. But there are times we're going to get before important people. And usually it's because of righteousness going against the grain. Yeah? And God will have you stepping up a notch because he knows this is your only shot right here. This is your only shot. You might never get before this police officer again. You might never get before this judge again. You might never get before this boss again who hates you because of your Christian position. This might be the only chance you get, so don't waste it. It takes faith. I remember before I left my career, I used to work for the ESPN television network in America, a famous sport channel, cable sport channel. And this was like a dream job for me as a young person in my 20s. And uh, I started to sense that God was calling me out. <clears throat> Excuse me. And just as I was leaving, about six to eight months before I left, ESPN started to really ramp up the LGBT agenda. Um, ESPN is owned by the Disney company, which was big LGBT even before LGBT started to become mainstream. Disney was one of the, the big propagators even back in the late 90s. It was subtle, but they were the one doing it. ESPN's part of it. You know how it is in the corporate world. Everybody just has to follow in suits. So I started to become very concerned about this. And there was actually an open event held on our campus. It's a gigantic campus, large television network. It was an event where uh, employees could come and they could testify openly before others about how they've come out of the closet. And this was open to anybody. And they were actually uh, broadcasting it through a loudspeaker on the campus. And when this happened, I felt like God was saying, enough, enough is enough. So the president of ESPN, who was a very, very powerful man in the sports media industry, as powerful as he was, he had an open door policy that he would meet with any employee. And I said, well, I'm going right to the top. So I emailed his secretary. It took me three months to get into his office. The first two meetings we had, she canceled him because I was just a peon. I'm low on the totem pole. Something better came along. Maybe he had to have lunch or something. <laughs> had to wait two times. Finally, after three months, I got into his office. And we sat in us was the Olympic torch. The Olympic torch. It was Olympic year. And he said to me, that there's the torch. And I thought, I know, obviously. He said, do you want to hold the torch? So I got to hold the Olympic torch. Kind of a, a cool moment. And we made small talk, and he said, what can I do for you? And the Lord had told me beforehand, just go in there and just tell him the truth. He said, I'm sending you to him like a prophet. Don't beat around, but just tell him the truth. So that's what I did. I said, I'm a Christian. And I said, I am concerned about the, the, the push for homosexuality in this company. There are other Christians that are just as concerned as I am, but they might not have the courage to speak up or do something. So I'm here not just for myself, I'm on their behalf. And I said, God judged two cities in the Bible, actually more than that, if you consider the sounding cities. God judged the city of Sodom because of uncontrolled homosexuality. And I said, if you do not repent for this, God is going to judge this company. 
That's what I said to the president of ESPN, just the two of us in the room. Now, this guy's pretty polished and is very good at not showing his cards. But even he had to, had to take a step back. Even he moved in his seat. I think he was shocked because he could just fire me on the spot, you know. So he gave a very diplomatic answer, as you would expect. He said, he thought about it for a moment, and he said, would you like your own Christian company, uh, your own Christian group on the campus? He was trying to be diplomatic. In other words, I, let the gays do their thing. I'll give you your thing. Yeah? Isn't this what they do in the communist countries? We're going to give you a church, but we're going to restrict what you can say. Yeah? We'll give you a salary. We'll give you a house. We'll make sure your family's taken care of. But you can't say this. You can't say that. I don't know if it would have gotten to that point, but we were already meeting privately for three years, the Christians. I didn't tell him that. So this is kind of the way it went. It was a very short meeting. But I share that as to say I had tremendous palpitations in the heart going into that room. And anything could have happened to me. But the Lord sent me there. The Lord protected me. And I knew that my time was short anyway. The timing of God. God could lead you to do the same thing. If the Holy Spirit is in it, he would want you to do the same thing. He might lead you to do the same thing. He might be telling you to go and talk to your boss or the general manager or the president or the CEO. He might actually be telling you to do that. And even if you are sacked from a position, and I'm not in any way suggesting go into your, your business or your job and just seek to be sacked. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying God is sovereign. He works all things together for good for his children. And he can provide a better job for you. He can provide a better salary for you. God knows every detail of your life, and he's going to watch over his people in these last days with such a jealousy and a protection. Hallelujah. Let's go to John 7. We were just there. John 7. I'm sorry, John 8. John 8. We already did John 7. Thank you. That's good. Yep. Here Jesus has gone back and forth with the Jews, the religious people. Uh, and he's basically told them that they're not really from Abraham. If they were, they would, they would really know who God is and they would know who he is. And this is getting very tense. And then at the end of the chapter, starting in verse 54, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God's. Yeah, you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Once again, basically declaring himself to be God, referencing a famous Old Testament account here where Moses sees the Lord in a burning bush, and the Lord speaks and says, I am that I am. And Jesus is referring to himself as I am. I have no beginning and I have no end. This is blasphemy. They want to take stones. They want to kill him. But he's able to get out. Why? Because it's not his time. It's not his time to die. Let's go on. John chapter 10. After declaring that he's the one that gives eternal life. In verse 28. And then in verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. Essentially another blasphemous statement. What happens in verse 31 of John chapter 10? Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Then he talks a little bit more. Go down to verse 39. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hands. Why did they not stone him? Why did he escape out of their hands? Because it was not his time. He could be as bold and as direct as God wanted him to be. He knew what his time was. He knew when he was going to die, and he knew when he was not going to die. Now there were times where he would live in an area, 
and then he might come back. We saw that earlier on, we looked at chapter seven, he left Judea for six months and then came back. So it's not like he was just arbitrarily hanging around and putting himself in harm's way. He was doing this prayerfully. He was doing it with wisdom. But as he did, God was faithful to speak to him and they could not get him. Even when they had the chance to get him, there was a supernatural, sovereign, Holy Ghost restraint upon his, that, that his life was protected. Now, my arrest, it's not just because of my arrest that I'm preaching this message. I'm living out these particular, these last few verses that I'll just share with you. Because last Wednesday, I was in uh, the city of St. Albans with Pastor John Sherwood. We were preaching on the street. This is a very upmarket area, affluent, as you probably know. And I think the people were taken aback by how direct we were and uncompromising. And at one point, I had said something about Islam and very truthful, but it was, it was obviously a critical statement, but it was a truthful statement. And someone phoned the police, and I could see this man on the, on the phone while I was standing on the box speaking. And usually, almost never will I leave an area, never. I just say, God, you've brought me here. If the police come, they come. But I'm in a different situation right now because I've already got this simple caution, and it's not been overturned. And if they come back again and they want to put on a show for the people in this upmarket uh, area where there's markets and people are walking around, they can do that. So I said to John Sherwood, I finished my preaching and I said to him, I have to leave this area. And he said, well, let's just go down the street to a different spot. I said, no, I have to leave the high street. I think police are going to come. I need to leave. So I left and I went to I went down a side street. I walked through a shopping center, went into a few shops, came back 30 minutes later. When I had been preaching, I was wearing a white T-shirt, but I had brought this gray jumper with me. But I was not wearing it while I was speaking. God is good. I could have been, but I wasn't. But before I left the area, I decided to put this on because I knew that they would give a description of me, please, and they'd be looking at looking for the description. I came back into the area 30 minutes later, and I walked right past a police car. There were two people sitting in the front seat of the police car, two officers, wearing this jumper. And I walked right past them. They didn't, they didn't notice. John Sherwood was preaching across the street. So I crossed the street and I joined him again and spent about 30 minutes ministering with him and another lady that was on the team. And John told me when he finished preaching, he said, the police came back for you. They, he said, they came for you. And that particular car that I had walked past, that was the car that they had come in. He said, they came, they want to speak to you. They even asked him for my phone number, which he did not give. And he told them that I might be back later. I don't know why he said that, but he did. Well, he, he's, he's going to court too. I mean, it's like six of one, half dozen of the other, you know? So who knows? But uh, so we finished our ministry 30, 35 minutes after I had returned. And I said, I think I need to leave again because I just felt in my spirit they're going to come. So sure enough, I left and I went to the train station. I said to John, I'll call you when I get there. He had, a, he had a car. He came to fetch me at the train station. 20 minutes later, he said, they came back a second time. But the Holy Spirit was speaking, and he was protecting me. Two days later, this past Friday, in Ilford, East London, I was there with two people from Court Farm, highly Muslim area, and, of course, just preaching the gospel. That's not really that offensive. But at a certain point, I started to hit on Islam. And the incredible stabbing of this Christian preacher in Speaker's Corner a few weeks ago, this converted Muslim. And the, the, the man that's committed this crime is still walking the streets freely. And I began to touch on this, how this might actually be what Islam actually is. And 20 minutes later, four police officers showed up. I didn't see them coming. They just came. And it was a high street. I couldn't really get was There was nowhere to go. So one of the guys that was with me on the team, he's an ex-cop of a big imposing man you know when he when he has when he wants to say something and make a point it can be a little bit intimidating actually so the police came and the lead officer read, read off what i had said and it was hard for me not to laugh actually because it was a pretty good description and um and this gentleman that was with me he knew exactly what questions to ask the police and what to say to them he didn't tell them he was an ex-cop but he knows the law inside and out, and he knew exactly how to speak their language to the point where they just backed down and they left. Four of them. 
This is a new thing. You need four officers to come for a street preacher. This is a new thing now in London. So the point is this. I will not be on an airplane out of this country or in a jail cell again until it is my time. And I can go and be led by the Holy Spirit with wisdom, of course, prayerfully, and do what God is leading me to do. And nothing more is going to happen to me until it is my time. Let's look at two more examples. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Now, this is after Jesus' triumphal entry. This is right toward the end of his life. And as I said earlier, he goes into the temple uh, the morning after they're basically worshiping him on the way in. And he uh, overturns the temples or the, the tables in the temple, drives out the money changers and those who bought and sold. And this, of course, incites the religious people. Verse 18, and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city, meaning Jesus. Okay, they wanted to destroy him here and there. This is a few days before he's taken and crucified. They want to destroy him here and there, but what? They feared him because the people were astonished. But Jesus is still thinking, I don't know. They're pretty angry at me. So what does he do at nighttime? He leaves the city. He could have stayed in the city. He left the city. This is a few days before he's killed. But yet the timing of God is so perfect. It was still not yet his time. Every day matters. Every hour matters. Every minute and every second. And if you are a person of purpose and commitment to the kingdom and God-focused and God-centered, and if there's a target on your back, every decision does matter. I'll be honest with you, folks. It's hard living like this, but it's pretty fun. It's pretty fun. Because when I go back to America, it's going to be boring in the beginning. We don't have this Public Order Act yet, although I'm sure these things are coming with these crazy left-wing nut jobs that we have in Washington. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm sure these come eventually, but we don't have those things quite yet. But right now, it is hard, but it's, it's an exciting thing to know I must be led by the Holy Spirit and really hear his voice so clearly. Just days before Jesus died, it was not his time, and he was still fleeing to protect himself. Go over to Mark chapter 12. Here he spoke a parable and talking about the Jewish people. He's using a parable of a, a wicked vine dresser, and he's essentially telling them that he's going to be killed. It's a parable as the son, and that the kingdom's going to be given to the Gentiles. And this was a theme that often incited them the most. And what did they say? What did they do in verse 12? Mark 12 and verse 12, they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude for they knew he had spoken this parable against them, or he had spoken this parable against them. So they left him and they went away. Why? We're only to, we're now closer to his death. They want to kill him, but yet still they won't kill him because still it is not his time. Up until the day, the hour, the minute, and the second, he's protected. And look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing just days before he's crucified. He's blasting the religious. He's blasting the Jews. He knows it's not time yet. Hallelujah. Oh, how the devil wants us to live in fear. I just want to see chains and fear come off of all of you. Let the chains be broken in the name of Jesus. Be free in Jesus Christ. Be free to walk into the school and sit in front of the headmaster and say, my child is not going to listen to this filth. And I'm not just here on behalf of my own child. I'm here on behalf of every other child in school because this is my community. And I go to church in this community and I pray for this community. I'm not going to sit back and watch you destroy these children. Are you only concerned about your own kids, your own job, your own house? We are part of a kingdom. We are light and salt. We are responsible for this whole generation. Turn to Acts, please. Acts chapter 
21, I believe it is. Acts chapter 21. Paul and his team are traveling. They just left Ephesus or spy to the Ephesians for the last time. And he's on his way to Jerusalem. That's where he's planning to go. And they're going through these different island areas by boat. Let's pick it up in verse 3. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed a tire for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Okay, so now in Tyre, he's being told not to go to Jerusalem. Not any kind of uh, bold warning or prophetic warning necessary. They're just saying, don't go. It doesn't give us much more detail than that. They continue on the journey, and they get to Caesarea. Let's pick it up in verse 8. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of seven and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, thus the Holy Spirit says, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Verse 12, now when they did these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am not ready only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, the will of the Lord be done. Now he is given a prophetic picture by a legitimate recognized prophet. This is what's going to happen to you. At this point, it's undeniable. This is a word from God. But Paul is so determined that God is leading him here. Now, there's been debate among scholars over the years whether he actually should have done this. But the debate is irrelevant. This is God's sovereignty. God led him. Paul wanted to get there. Important. So he went. And what happened? He got to Jerusalem. He ended up being attacked. And what happened? He was given a platform to stand up before everybody in Jerusalem and give his testimony. It was because he was arrested in Jerusalem and, was, and incited that mob, and he did before, and then once, when he was given his testimony, he began to talk about how God sent him to the Gentiles. That incited the mob again, so they took him back into custody. And it was because of that that he got passed all over the place and ended up going before Felix, the governor, and having all the, and Agrippa, the king, and eventually ended up where he wanted to go, but it never had been, which was Rome. Because he was willing to suffer. What an exciting life. We talk about how great this man was, how great his ministry was. Look at that story. He's not sitting before Felix and Agrippa and going to Rome. None of this is happening if he's not willing to go to Jerusalem and suffer first. And sometimes the great plan that God has for your life, and I don't say that in a flaky modern day way as we hear that often. God does have a plan and a purpose for your life. But it's not going to be fulfilled at the level he wants it to be unless you're willing to suffer. Unless you're willing to go into the hard places. He had a choice. He didn't have to go to Jerusalem. But his love for the people and his desire to get there overrode everything else. Hallelujah. This is exciting. This is exciting to see this kind of faith. And isn't it interesting? We just read it in verse 13. He said, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? Isn't this similar to what happened when uh, the disciples told Jesus not to go to the cross? And Jesus turned, Paul's much more gracious than Jesus was. Jesus turned to them and said, get behind me, Satan. We heard it this morning. It was read in the beginning text. Paul says, why are you doing this to me? Can't I just serve God radically and obediently without you getting in my way? Says Paul. 
Can't I just be radical without the false church and the co compromised church and the apostate church and family and all these other people trying to stop me so I can preserve my life in the Western world, which is headed for communism, which is all about money and materialism and selfishness? Who wants to live like this as a Christian? How boring is that? He says, I'm not ready only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of of the Lord Jesus. But guess what? When he got to Jerusalem, he didn't die. When he got to Rome, he didn't die. Why? Because it was not yet his time. It was not his time. Revelation chapter 12, last verse, and I'm finishing. Thank you for staying with me. I don't know how much time I had, but thank you. Thank you. Revelation 12. Starting at verse 11, Revelation 12, famous verses. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. The devil is stepping the game up another notch, isn't he? He's taking it to the next level. He knows that his time is right. What's, the, what's the, uh, the answer to this? What's our response, the previous verse? We overcome it by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. We, we recognize what Jesus did for us on the cross. We preach the gospel message. We know that we're sealed by the blood that we are his child in covenant relationship with him. We speak our testimony because there's great power in it. The first, I told that 20 year old girl today, Alana, I said, you should come back into this town and start sharing your testimony immediately. I said, go home and tell your family, tell as many people as you know what's happened to you. Hallelujah. The devil is stepping it up a notch, folks. Are you willing to step it up a notch? Are you going to love your life unto the death? And I want to say this lastly, I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to say this because this is something that's, that's in our circle right now and it's, it's an important thing to us. I'm not terribly impressed by people that spend all their time talking about the validity of this fact, Christians I'm talking about. I don't think this makes you spiritual, but there's a lot of conversation today about this for people who won't share their faith, who won't fast, who don't spend much time reading their Bibles or seeking the face of God, but they're obsessed with saying how bad this vaccine is. Okay, I for one want to tell you, you can talk about anything you want to, but please, I don't think you're spiritual because you've studied this vaccine inside and out. That does not make you a spiritual person to me because there are far more important issues right now than this. I believe the devil has gotten us, has, has gotten us backed into a corner with this thing. And I believe some people are so obsessed with this because they're really not serving God the way they're supposed to be. So they have so much time on their hands. So they just spend hours researching this vaccine and watching YouTube videos and figuring out the origins of COVID. I, for one, for whatever it's worth, I am not impressed. If you come out in the streets with me and play a guitar, you hand out some tracks, you get down on your knees and witness to somebody, that impresses me. But not this obsession with this vaccine. Where is your heart at today? Where are your priorities? What are most important to you? I understand fully there's issues with this vaccine. I'm not in any way endorsing it. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying our priorities are not right. I really believe that in my heart. And there are more important things than our physical health. Let's not forget that. Of course the world is going to take a vaccine. That's all they care about is physical self and preservation. Of course they're going to do that. Can we expect anything different from the world? My message is not to, to the world is not don't get vaccinated. My message is come to Jesus and be saved. Time is running short. Yes, there is an agenda behind this. Yes, be aware of it. But this is not the focus of what I'm talking about. And if, if it is your focus, I really think you need to go into prayer and seek God and ask him really where your priorities are. And if this is really the most important thing to the Lord right now.
Hallelujah. Could you come and sing a song? That'd be okay. I realized that, uh, that this is heavy. I realized it was heavy. I don't make any apologies for anything that I said. But I realized it was heavy. Thank you for staying here and being with me. Mm. As John sings, this is the last meeting. I want to give you an opportunity again to come forward. Some of you didn't come forward this morning simply because you're too proud to. This man preached a wonderful message mm. yes, this morning and yesterday morning. Mm. Some of you didn't come because you're not humble enough. It's, a, it's that simple. It's your national pride. It's your, your British pride. It's cultural. God's not impressed. God wants you to humble yourself. Mm. I want to give you an opportunity tonight, as John sings, to come forward. And I would like to pray with people. I'd like to pray that God gives you boldness and gives you courage to stand in the last days. To pray that the Lord gives you wisdom and discernment to do what he wants you to do. Say what he wants you to say. Go where he wants you to go. Not go where he does not want you to go. Mm. When it, and, and be sensitive to when it is your time and when it is not your time. Yeah? Mm. So as he sings, if you would like prayer for boldness, mm. for courage, yes. for wisdom. I'm just a man, but I, I'm living something very special right now. I'm just a man. God has chosen to use me. But I, I'm in a unique season of my life and my ministry. In seven weeks, it's going to be over. It's going to be back to normal again. Yeah? But the Lord's given me an authority to speak on this topic because it's happening right now. Yeah? That's why I've talked about it. If you would like prayer, either for the second time, maybe want to come up again, or maybe you felt like you should have come this morning and you didn't, I'd like to invite you to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.